some time for questions at the end. Uh, remember, this is being recorded. So if you don't want to be on screen, you should turn your cameras off. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Donna. You have a great session. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Um, this um, three-part series that we have been doing about the fundamentals of preschool and enriching our mindset has been um, a wonderful experience for me as well. I feel like um, I, um, uh, I am also growing and learning as uh, an educator, as a professor, as a teacher, um, looking at different ways uh, to help teachers, pre-K teachers, kindergarten teachers, cycle one teachers, as well as educators in the field um, to move forward with, you know, the Quebec preschool um, plan, as well as, you know, coming to you with developmentally appropriate practices and, and just having this wonderful discussion about preschool children who, you know, if you work with them, you know how wonderful they are, you know how amazing the whole experience is. And I'm just hoping that through these sessions, through these webinars, that I can help you or give you more tools to be successful in your um, everyday interactions with this age group. So uh, today we've decided to talk about observing young children. Now, I got to tell you, um, when the play committee and Chris came to me about ob observing young children, I kind of said, okay, but, you know, I, I'm not sure we could do this in an hour. And they reassured me that um, sometime in the new year, in the new school year, that we will definitely be revisiting this um, idea of observing young children, because it's a really important part of uh, being an educator in the field of early childhood and in the field with pre-K and kindergarten children. And we will continue to um, give you more and more tools. So today is just kind of um, wetting the palette a little bit um, to get you to understand, um, you know, the importance of observation. The, I give, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools. We're going to watch a video and uh, we're going to sort of work on observing and what does that mean and how and what to do with it afterwards? So all of these things are an ongoing process and I'm, I'm excited to know that, uh, that um, they've invited me back for the, for the fall. So we're gonna keep working together and we're gonna, um, um, I'll be able to give you more tools. So moving forward, let's get to this um, presentation. Um, I just, okay, hold on a second, of course. Um, so this is me. Uh, for those of you who've been here a couple of times, I added a few little things. Uh, the Infinite Educator is my, my company. I uh, do have my MA from Child Studies at Concordia. I've been an early childhood educator for 10 years, uh, a professor at Vanier for 19. And I just threw in a few fun facts that I am an avid uh, reader of historical fiction because I also have a degree in history and I love history and I have too many pets to count. So I have, I'm a rescuer of animals. So that's also who I am. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little insight onto me. Now, as part of the program that, uh, you know, when I was doing this workshop and um, sort of, you know, creating this, I went back to the Quebec preschool program and, and kind of looked at some of the, the requirements that the, the MEQ wants the pre-K and the kindergarten teachers to look at. And I this sort of paragraph jumped out at me because I think it's really important that we recognize that uh, in a preschool program, we have to look at the overall global development of the children in our care. We have to look at the physical, the motor, the emotional, the social, the language, and the cognitive development. This isn't school where we're focusing mostly on the cognitive development. We're looking at the whole child, right? And it's vital to understand that um, each developmental domain has to be sort of of equal importance and sort of dealt with, and I like the word that they used here, in synergy, because to create this, this little human, right? It's a whole person. We're not just teaching them how to write their name. We're not just teaching them 
their colors or or the alphabet or anything. It's teaching them about social skills. We're teaching them about self-regulation. We're teaching them how to hold the pencil, how to move their body and how to talk and to express themselves. All of this is all part of our package of a preschool child that is in our care. So in the educational context, we have to sort of look at the various areas of development and how they are influenced and reinforced by each other. So I just thought this was a good way to sort of start the whole program and sort of thinking about, it's not just about the learning per se, it's about the overall development of the child. So here, just talking about developmental domains, um, just as a reminder, and I'm sure you guys have seen this uh, many, many times, but I think it's important to, to look at the global picture of the child and, and really talk about the child's emotional development, their social skills and how they enter into play, how they interact with people, how the language in which they use, how much language do they have? Um, you know, what are their cognitive skills? You know, are they using their executive functions? And how do they move their body? And do they interact in small or fine motor activities that uh, promote, you know, being able to hold a pencil or a marker, you know, being able to do all of that. And through observation, and only through observation, like skilled observation, can we really acknowledge or identify what a child is capable of doing? The MAQ talks about it in, in the um, idea of identifying their skills. What do children know? How do we know this? Right? How do we know what the children know unless we sit down and have a conversation with them or, or you know, take notes on what they're doing? What are they learning? Is the things that we're doing in our classroom actually working for that child? If, if you don't take an observation, you'll never know. What are their interests? Because when we gear our curriculum towards children's interests, they're engaged, they have an emotional connection. So we want all of those things to happen. What questions are they asking? What kind of attitudes do they have? What kind of behaviors that maybe we need to change? These are all things that we have to sort of think about when we're looking at the whole pre-K child. And what's really important, and MAQ brings this up, and I'm a huge believer in this, is that free play is your best opportunity to observe children with their interactions in a natural context, just to be able to sit there and have a conversation with children. Maybe it's during snack time, maybe it's in the dramatic play, maybe you're in the block area. All of these uh, provide opportunities for you to really get to know what is the child really able to do. And then we're gonna talk about, as we move through this workshop, you know, what are we gonna do with that once we know? So this is important for us to be able to know about this. So observations are key to helping educators and teachers really identify what it is a child knows. And so this is why when we're observing young children, the first thing we have to do is that we have to listen and we have to observe. It's essential in your preschool program, in your pre-K program. And through observations, educators will discover the children's skills, interests, and what is it that they need from us? What is the language that we need to say to a child? What is the skill that the child may or may not still be working on that we need to provide activities, materials, maybe a different learning environment, provide more for them to be able to move forward in their learning. And three, how, when educators do these observations, we have to look at it as a strength-based approach to observing. It was interesting when I was going through the MAQ, there was a lot of stuff about, you know, uh, observing for intervention. And I can't, I, I'm not going against the MAQ, but I do believe that it's important for us to see the what the child is capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing. And so 
when we take observations uh, based on what we believe the child is capable of doing, we know that baseline, right? And that's why it's so very important to take observations throughout the year, because we need to know where, what are we starting with? Think about your beginning of the school year in September. Do you have a classroom full of children who just turned four? Because that's going to create a whole different environment than if you had a classroom of children who were um, who just turned five, or who will be turning five after the September 30th uh, date. So that changes everything: how you set up your classroom, your teaching strategies, your your activities, your your experiences. The whole thing is changed. But we have to start with that baseline. Where are their strengths? And where can I lead them to? And we do that through the observations that we take throughout the course of the year. And we use a variety of observational tools because we need to provide a whole picture of a child. So we might use an anecdotal observation for one particular behavior. Maybe we're going to use a running record because we want to see how they are in their social skills. Maybe we do an ABC sample because Maybe a child is having, um, you know, a certain behavior that we have to figure out what is triggering that behavior. So we figure out what the antecedent is, what the behavior, what the consequences are. We take samples. I mean, children love to draw. They love to hand over that, that, that drawing to you, all of their, their artwork. These are all great opportunities for you to keep and use as observations. And lucky for us we all have phones uh, we can videotape we can we can take photos these are all some things that we can can do in terms of observations so i just want to go through a few of the uh, informal assessment tools i'm not here to get into the whole formal assessment when a child is um, uh, obviously struggling or needs to have uh, an assessment done, uh, you know, uh, by a psychologist or anything. I'm talking about the everyday observations in which the tools that you will, you can use as educators, as teachers in your classroom on a daily basis that will help you understand individual children and the group of children in which you have. So these types of assessment tools enable educators to collect information about what the children know and their development, and it's a specific process. So if you had to hand these documents over to, let's say, a psychologist or a, you know, a therapist or something like that, you have this documentation to say, this is what I'm seeing in the classroom. So this is also very important, but it does give the educator some latitude on, you know, how and when the observation is taken. So I think it's really important that we look at some of these tools so that you're able to um, maybe utilize them. I mean, I know it's May and everybody's kind of getting to the end of that school year, but these are really great tools. I hope that you guys take this video and and, and re-watch it come August so that you can uh, look at some of these tools. I won't go too deep into it. Maybe we'll do this in the fall more, but, um, but these are some of the tools that we teach our um, educators to use in the Van May program, so. Um, this is the one that's the most common, right? So the uh, anecdotal observation. This is just a brief narrative describing in detail an incident of, of child behavior that is important. Maybe the child said something, maybe the child did something. Um, but I always tell my students, it's like, it's like a photo, right? It's like if you, somebody handed you a photo and said, okay, now write a paragraph about what it is that you see in this photo, that's an an anecdotal observation, right? You have your time, you have your place, you have your understanding of the setting. So where was it during free play? Was it outside? Um, was it during a small group or a large group experience? Maybe it was during circle, the age of the child at the time. And then you write your information in a, in a brief paragraph, helping you to understand, boom, when I was an early childhood educator, uh, when I did my anecdotal observations, my poor classroom had these white, uh, not the white, the yellow post-it notes, 
all over the classroom with a pencil close by, you know, high up that the children can't get it, but enough that I could just grab something and I would write down. So let's say for example, I was working in the toddler classroom and the child said for the first time, no, my, instead of perhaps biting a child, well, I'm grabbing my notepad, I'm writing that down, I'm writing down the time, I'm writing down the child. And I used to open up my cupboard and I would stick all of these yellow post-it notes into my cupboard. And when the children were sleeping, I would sit at my desk and I would just write out the anecdotal observations. It doesn't have to be like this full thing right in the moment. You can do it um, later on, get the gist of the information right there and then. So this one is always a really good uh, strategy to use. And it's always good. like you can hand this over, like I said, to a psychologist or a therapist, and they will be able to decipher exactly the behavior that, that you're talking about. Now, a running record is a little bit longer and it usually takes a little bit more time. You need to sit off to the side. I like to use running records in, um, in the dramatic play or in the block area or anything during large group experiences because it gives me a more detailed account of the behavior and what what is happening in the scenario like you know you have four children who are in the dramatic play who you know who's the character and like what, what are the, what are they talking about what you can get so much information just writing it down writing it down you do get a hand cramp, I'm warning you now, you do get, but you just write and write and write and write, giving the time, understanding what it is and being able to give comments. And the comments do not have to come right away. But if you're just writing down all that stuff, this helps a lot too with language, with dialogue, with interacting. How are the children entering into play? How are the children um, once they are in play, what are they doing once they're there? Are they just sitting back? Are they leaders? Are they, um, you know, trying to figure out um, their place in, in the classroom? And you could do this for a group of children, or you could do it for an individual child. Now, the ABC observation is also called event sampling, but we go by ABC. Um, it's usually an observational tool that is more specific um, uh, behaviors that you kind of want to target. You know, I'm sure for those of you in the kin in the in the pre-K and the kindergarten classes, you've you've seen children have moments that kind of happen around the same time, like. What happens, uh, you know, uh, I've seen it a lot around that 11 o'clock just before lunch. I don't know if everybody gets hangry or something, but you got to look at the behaviors that are happening at a particular time. Maybe it's happening um, when the child is dropped off in the morning. Maybe the child stays very late at night. And so maybe the child may be, this, uh, you know, having behavioral issues at the end of the day, but if the child shows up at seven in the morning and he's still at school at five o'clock, well, we gotta understand that maybe that day is a little bit too long. And if we can come to the parent or to the administration or whoever else we can talk to and say, okay, well, this is what's happening. This is the behavior. These are the consequences. It's all laid out right there. And, and from there, we can figure out strategies to help this child, right? That's what observations are for, is to help children move along in their growth. And it could be through behavior, it could be social skills, it could be self-regulation, it could be just about anything. So it's really important that we think about that. Okay, so moving forward. As we know, children samples, like children love to give us artwork, and this is really important that we keep this artwork because it does in, uh, give us a good indication of the progression of the child's ability through the school year. So, you know, you might take something that the child has given you or you may have collected something, let's say in September, um, maybe you see another one in December that you wanna keep and we want to see that progression, you know? If you're starting like, with an example with the right bottom or maybe uh, you know at the top here where he's got the purple circle here and then it moves on to this 
one. I mean, this is not, this is growth, right? We see that children are growing and their ability to uh, draw, their ability to write, their ability to hold markers and pencils evolve over the school year. And this is a very concrete way to demonstrate uh, to parents, to administration, to you know, doing your assessments, how the child is moving along in their fine motor skills and understanding what, you know, being able to follow along with instructions. If there's something that they're specifically supposed to do, how are they doing it? Are they able to follow that instruction? So there's also that cognitive element that is right there. So as using samples of children's work throughout the course of the year, you really do see an evolution of what a child can do. And it's very concrete. Um, and it's very um, tangible, not only for you, but it's also very tangible to show the parents. I know that in, in, um, in, our, in our school, you know, parents are constantly bombarded with the artwork or whatever. I always tell my students, it's really, really important for them um, to talk to the parents about what it is that they're taking home. Because what they're seeing isn't just a scribble on, on the piece of paper. It's a child who may have said, oh, this is my family. You know, this is what my mommy looks like. This is what my daddy looks like. And maybe to a, a, a you know, a parent or somebody who's just looking at it, maybe it's, it's just scribbles, but to a child, that's their family. And then there's going to see their mother throw it in the garbage. So we have to sort of educate the parents as well when it comes to the children's artwork. And I'm not saying you should keep every single piece of artwork that a child has because your classroom will look like a disaster. But at the same time, you know, this is where observation comes in. It's really important that we have that kind of sample. And pictures or videos. We all have our phones now. We all have uh, um, opportunities to video or take pictures of. I know in a lot of the Centre de la Petite Enfance, um, they have all been given, and I, I don't, don't be envious, but they all have been given tablets uh, where they are able to do documentation through their tablets. So they take the picture, they take the video, and then they're able to take the anecdotal observation and make the connection. And, and in all of the CPE now, they have to come up with uh, you know, these kind of documentations, these portfolios. And every day, every day now in the CPEs, the, um, the educators are sending at least one developmental domain um, picture, video, whatever, to a parent saying, look at what your child did today. This is the connection um, and, and helping parents understand developmental domains, understanding their child's growth and understanding the importance of the learning that's taking place uh, in the classroom. And I think that's an important element of combining and creating that partnership between families, and, and the educator or the school so that you can get a full picture of what that child is. So pictures, videos, all of that kind of stuff, um, really important to be able to uh, have evidence-based information. And like I said, to be able to show the parents. Now, this is where we are gonna have some fun. So I have a video that I would like to show all of you that have shown up today. And thank you for showing up and giving us your time. Um, you don't have to use an, uh, uh, any of the tools I just showed you because I kind of went through that like really super fast. Um, but I'm gonna show you the video. And what I'd like you to do is just write down as much as you can see, um, as much information as you can about the following five developmental domains. So look for fine motor skills, look for gross motor skills, look for the children's social and emotional interactions, look for how they, they handle certain things and listen to their language. So the video I'm going to show you is a video about four or five young children they are from England um, it is a mud kitchen outside so for those of you who don't like messy <laughs> this is going to be interesting um, uh, and and the interactions that they have 
uh, what I will need is afterwards, after we show the video, um, I would like to, or Chris is going to put, or Michael, sorry, is going to put everybody into a breakout room um, to discuss what it is that you saw in the video. Um, and what I'd like you to do is um, have the discussion about, you know, what the developmental domains did you see? Um, what were some of the information that you got out of that? of the clip, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to connect it to the developmental domains, but just kind of look at the video and, and see what you, you know, let us know what you see. And once you get into the breakout rooms and you've discussed that, what I would like you to do then is, okay, so here's this group of, of, of little girls who are in the mud kitchen. And now you have this observation. What would you do next? Based on that observation, what would you do? Would you, what kind of activity, what kind of experience, what kind of learning would be their next step? So, so it's kind of twofold. I want you to discuss what it is that you see in the video. And then I want you to think about all of the things that you could do to um, take their interests, take what they're capable of doing and bring it either back in the classroom or, or again, outside, whatever it is, but how do you add to their learning based on what you just saw? So that's the two things that I would really like you to, to look at. Um, one person in the group will be the uh, note taker, please, um, so that we can get as much information as we can. Um, some of the play committee and myself will also pop into the, um, into each of the breakout rooms to be able to discuss with you and to, to, to help facilitate the, the discussion. And then we're gonna come back after, the, after all of that and we're gonna have a large group discussion about what it is that you saw, what are some of the activities? Because I think it's important for all of us to be able to share and to have this, um, this great discussion because what you see and what I see may be completely different. Um, and so these are things that I think are important for us to um, work together on. So, so that's what um, the, our next step is. Is everybody okay with that? Is that, um, are, we, are we good? The instructions are clear, yeah? Okay. So let's see if I can, <laughs> if I can get this to work. Uh, if not, then I have a backup. So, uh, so it is a... Is this gonna... No. Okay. Let me stop share. Sorry about that, everybody. Let me go here.
Okay, so that was the video of the mud kitchen. Now, uh, Michael's going to put everybody into breakout rooms. And yes, so if you want to see it again, if you want to review it, uh, it has been put into the chat. So it might be a little bit easier for everybody to go back and have that kind of uh, discussion. I know it was only once. Um, sometimes we have to see these things a couple of times to be able to fully assess what is going on. That's why videos are so great, right? So um, so I think what's going on, so that's, that, that's the video that I want you to observe. Again, look for, you know, uh, both fine and gross motor, look for social and emotional, and look for language, okay? So all within the context of that video. And based on what you see and based on what you have learned briefly about these uh, group of children in the mud kitchen, uh, try to come up with some activities, experiences, learning environment, um, materials, things that you could move the children forward in their, um, in their learning based on what you just saw. Oh, we're back to recording. Okay, we're good. Okay. We're good. Okay, so um, I would like, Chris, I just see you. You are very big in my picture. <laughs> okay, now I see me. I'd like to see everybody else. Is that, Michael, is there possible that we could just see everybody? If you go in your top right corner and click on the view. Oh, I click on view, gallery. view gallery. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now I can see everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really excited to actually see people and actually have conversations with you. Um, I feel um, as I'm doing this in Zoom, uh, I literally just sit here with my animals. <laughs> I just talk to my animals. Um, anyways, so um, so Chris and I have talked about perhaps maybe next year we're going to do something in person, so you actually get to see just not just my big head and my big hair. <laughs> I get to see the whole thing. Um, okay, so um, what did we see in this video? Who were our documentation people? And would you like to share? Either you could do it through the chat or you can uh, unmute yourself and let us know what were some of the things, the aspects, what are the developmental domains that people were able to pick up on in this? I know it was a short video, but what were some of the developmental domains that you were able to pick up on? Anyone? Me? Go ahead. Yep, Natalie. Natalie. Um, yep. What we noticed, uh, fine motor, they were enjoying themselves a lot with the often saying sticky mud, uh, especially this that one little girl that was in the grass and just uh, going away at it. And um, we were saying maybe it was her first time experiencing this, or maybe mm -hmm. she had sensory issues, but was not uh, repelled by it and was enjoying it. Um, we noticed that maybe she was a little bit younger than the rest of the group, had limited uh, vocabulary maybe to express herself. Um, it was also gross motor in the sense that they were using real pots and pans and filled up with heavy mud and, and, and grass and water. Uh, so that was a good gross motor uh, activity. Um, emotionally, 
uh, when one girl dropped the, the, the container of water, they didn't seem too bothered by it. In my I classroom, it would have been like whack or a push. Yeah, or yeah, stuff. I love that. They're like, they oh, were, well. They, they, she didn't seem too bothered. One of them said in their cute little British accent that she would have to go back to the fountain and fill up the pot. Uh, <laughs> and the other one would have to cook it all over water. again. But the one girl wearing that green suit at one point, I don't think she was upset, uh, but she kind of just like moved the other girl's cheek away as she was talking to her. I guess it was like saying no. Um, but did you yeah. notice somebody apologized to Lauren? We're, uh, we're sorry, no. Lauren. And then we started to go back and like, that's that's fabulous information it was, right? and they were very respectful and they, you know they remained calm in their green zone nobody lost it um helping each other out it was very sweet yeah it was very it was a lot of cooperative play a lot of good imagination that was taking place there was compassion and empathy that that we could see there's yeah. a lot of good stuff anybody else want to share thank you very much for that Anybody else want to share? I know we're running out of time quick. Okay, so how about we go into the activities? What were some of the things that you guys thought about that you could help these children move forward in their learning based on what you saw? Anybody have some activities that they that they uh, want to share? Hey there, I'll share. Sure, go um, ahead. Okay. Um, so what we had talked about was uh, we talked about all the aspects, but then we focused on the the girl who found lots of joy touching the mud. And so we had we decided that uh, oh, sorry, we discussed that perhaps uh, what we could do to uh, push it forward would be to bring other things and have her um, maybe describe like put out other objects maybe in a, a like it could be a branch it could be other piece a whole bunch of grass different so that she could identify if she could get the same feeling from the mud uh, in other contexts like in other with other things um the other thing we talked about or was um uh the social emotional uh component um and the language component in the joy the intonation the ups and downs of that but so how could she express that so oftentimes when we talk about our emotions we talk about different or there is a, a program about uh, associating colors and emotion so mm -hmm. if joy could be that mud yeah. what could be sadness what could be other emotions and how they could be expressed in different nature contexts or in the classroom context so instead of talking it because it's also we're teaching colors and so without you know sort of respectfully uh, respecting the color red and or the color blue or the color green we could change that and turn it into something else like you know that's more tangible for the children to be able to make those connections with right they might see those things they might be able to make those kind of connections so that's wonderful i love that that's great thank you joanne anybody else want to share i know we're running out of time sorry chris i always talk too much i'm sorry anybody else want to share Um, I'll just speak a bit about what yeah. happened in our group, um, which you know, Donna. Yeah. Um, that uh, people were talking about how this can, you know, turn into the math and science part, where the, the kids are doing science and you're just bringing the words for them, or that you know, um, working with mud is kind of like working with recipes, and you can kind of bring in the baking elements. So you start to bring all that math and science. Um, but the sensory thing definitely, and the cooperativeness of it, and like letting kids get dirty, um, even when it's like bad weather out, try and get out and let them get all wet and dirty because it's better than bouncing off the walls. Absolutely. Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate that. That's that's very good. Okay, I know we only have two minutes. So I just want to share my screen for, for two minutes. And I just want to show you some of the activities that I had uh, designed or came up with uh, based on this observation. Let me see, I'm sorry, I have to find it. Um, so this were some of the things that I would, would have done if I did this observation. So based on this, like, and we talked about this in my group, we talked about uh, baking a cake, because um, 
I know that I know that with COVID and stuff like that, but, uh, baking with children is a huge thing, and pre-K children love to cook. And you're bringing in recipe charts, so you're getting them to like do some pre-reading. If you do the diagrams, you have the science, you have the math when you bake a, a cake. You can create a flower shop in your classroom. So then here you're bringing in the the dramatic play area. You can do social and emotional in the flower shop. Uh, you could do a field trip to um, to a bakery, and that brings in social studies and the sense of community. Planting flowers or trees, we talked about that too, Danielle in our group, we talked about planting. And then again, a lot of people brought in the water play and sensory experiences. So um, uh, we are out of time. Uh, I just wanna give everybody, uh, does anybody have any questions, any comments, anything that they wanna say before, um, we go, I just, personally for me, I just want, give me two seconds. I just want to say this has been a wonderful experience for me um, as a teacher, as somebody who's super passionate about early childhood, to be able to meet up with you guys and to give you these workshops. I, I so appreciate Chris contacting me and, and making this connection with Learn Quebec and the play committee. Um, I'm uh, super stoked about next year. I'm going to bring you tons of stuff. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. And I wish you all a very, very restful summer. <laughs> well, thank you, Donna. That was, um, again, really cool. I love this conversation. I'm really sorry that we can't talk more. Um, I know. We're, we're going to reflect more on getting more participation in the fall, in the year to come. Yes um because it was really fruitful um those breakouts were just full of amazing ideas and we we want to celebrate you guys as well because you come with such a richness and experiences that are great to share um i want to thank donna first off thank you very much this has been uh, really fun um <laughs> and a learning experience that uh, i'm glad that we discovered zoom's not so bad no. so it, it has its times, um, yes. but for us to all across uh, the province to come together and talk and share and, and share what we love is teaching and, and small kids and getting them to grow up into amazing people is um, something that we all share in common. So mm -hmm. it's great to share that with you. I want to thank to the play um, people. Um, you guys, uh, teachers out there, have got some wonderful um, preschool consultants. So yes, they're wonderful use them use them use them uh they have so many <laughs> amazing ideas and uh they will be in touch with you as well We're, we'll try to do a few face to face next year um so that we can actually get to see each other and play uh we really want to play um yes. and finally um i will send out the recording of this i'll send all the resources that we were mentioning i think craig in the background has been taking notes as well so that you can kind of listen back to this if you need to Everything that we've um, done this year has been recorded. We will, I'm gonna send you also a survey for next year. I'd love to have your input as to what you feel would be beneficial for you, for your practice, for your teaching. Um, so I'll send that with um, the recordings and all that tomorrow or the next day. 